Thanks, Nevi. Uh, hi, everyone. Good to be uh, be back. So some of you, some of your names sound familiar. Seen you before. Uh, a lot of new people as well. So that's nice. <clears throat> Right, so we're going to be talking about this topic, which is marriage. Is it a certified living? Um, you know, um, with a question mark, obviously. So the, this session is hopefully an attempt to answer the question. Reminded of this story, I do not know if it is true or if it is made up, but it is said of this young and gorgeous looking woman who approached George Bernard Shaw, who is this famous playwright, uh, uh, a literary um, genius of the 19th century, uh, G.B. Shaw, as he is you know, called. Uh, this woman come to, comes to George Bernard Shaw and says, uh, whispers in his ears really and says, it would, it not, would, it be, would, it, would it not be wonderful if we both got married together so the child born to us will have my beauty and your brain? To which George Bernard Shaw immediately replied, it seems that would be wonderful, but what if the child is born with my beauty and your brains? Right. And uh, that was the humor of the last several decades ago. If that same thing was said to George Bernard Shaw and Bernard Shaw had replied now, the woman would have probably said, let's find it out. Let's get into a living relationship and check it out. Right. So that is what we're going to see now. Is marriage really a certified living in the sense? What we're going to be looking at is in the age where slowly living relationship is becoming popular. Is marriage just a live-in relationship plus a certificate? Or in other words, does live-in relationship give us everything that a marriage gives minus that certificate? So what is the big difference, right? If, if live-in relationship gives me so much of those advantages without some of the commitments and without some of the legal tanglements of marriage, is that not a better option, right? So that's what we're gonna try and see because you saw all the promo, right? Of what is life before marriage and then what happens after marriage? Why go through all that hassle when living relationships seems to be a better option? So that's what we're gonna check. In other words, is marriage still relevant in a time where living relationship slowly seems to be catching up? <clears throat> that's what we're gonna be talking about. Right, um, you know, I'm interested with what Nivea said that uh, bombard him with questions just to get the records right in the questions in the quiz that was that was set before. Uh, I was the one who got zero answers correct. So that should kind of give you an idea as to how relevant I am here. So think twice before you bombard me with a lot of questions. But let me let me set this with you. Let me share this with you. Even a few decades ago, even the last decade, right? Early 2000s, if we had been asked to imagine about marriage and a family, right? To a common average person, regardless of where they are in the globe. And if you told them, think about a marriage and a family, what do you think of? Usually they would have said something like this. It is about a never before married man and a never before married woman coming together and they get married and they have two or more children. Commonly, that's what comes up in a very layman. It's about people who have not been married, hopefully coming together in marriage, and then they build a family and they have two or more children, right? So that's what people have thought about. But now think about it. Now, each of these parameters are being questioned. Yep, it doesn't have to be never before. It doesn't even have to be married. It doesn't even have to be a man and a woman. It doesn't have to be, they have to come into marriage. They don't have to be married to have children. They can be married and they need not have children. There's something called the voluntary childlessness. They're married, but they decide not to have uh, children. So think about it. In every parameters, this institution of marriage is being shaken. It's being um, you know, attempted to be transformed, to make a shift in marriage is being, is being made. Now, apart from that, there are some social uh, you know, um, trends that are shaking up the traditional model of marriage and family. There is increased acceptance of singlehood. There is no longer the pressure. Uh, in an Indian context, I would still say it is there, but that's also slowly changing in, in, urban, uh, in urban places. It's still possible for you to be single and there is really no much uh, pressure. Increased acceptance of co cohabitation, the live-in relationship. Increase in the failure of marriage. There's a lot of people who either separate or they're probably just sticking on to marriage unhappily though, right? Quite a few of you might have seen your parents like that. Uh, and there the question comes up, why get married to a person and then just you know, stick around unhappily or actually separate? 
why marry? So that is actually causing a lot of um, shift and shaking up the traditional model of marriage. And then transition of the commonly accepted gender roles, which is which is very common, which is, um, you know, decades ago, man was commonly the breadwinner. Now that is being, uh, you know, quite commonly ch ch um, changed. I work in a company with quite a lot of, uh, even in my own team, there are women who are the breadwinners and husbands are the ones who are taking care of the of the kids and um, at home. So those are all some of the shifts which are shaking up the traditional model of marriage and family. But here is here is the reality. In spite of all the shifts, in, in spite of cohabitation, in spite of increased acceptance of um, you know singlehood, in spite of the reality that we feel that marriage is a failed institute because I've seen people who divorce or just they stick around unhappily, the reality is even in a country like America where there is this, you know, there is this, um, all these ideas find its uh, expression in its highest superlative form. Even these new trends finds its expression in its superlative form. Even in America, 90% of people get married. So people over here that are about 94 uh, systems logged in, nine out of 10 of you will actually get married. If you were to just take even America status, if you go with Indian status, it's going to be much higher. So people still do get married, though the institution of marriage is going through change. It is going through transition, but it is nowhere an institution which has become irrelevant. Uh, there is still marriage happening and it's marriage is happening in, in huge numbers. Why is that so? Right. Uh, simply because of the uh, Maslow's, you know, the, the Maslow's need hierarchy. Right. You would have all been familiar with it. Once our physical, physiological needs, which is a basic air, water, food, and shelter is taken care, and the safety needs of personal security is taken care, once the basic needs are met, our immediate next lunging and the longing is for love and belonging. <clears throat> we want friendship, we want intimacy. Uh, there is a sense of getting into a family and a sense of connection. We long for relationships, right? We are a relational being. We are not just minds, right? We are not just... Uh, rational beings, we are emotional beings, we are relational beings, we long for that connection. So even as a, as a, as a baby, the baby loves to be with people, the nuzzle and the, and the cuddle and the voice, it, uh, the baby longs to hear that and be around that. So we are relational beings. And uh, just because of that, that need for the friendship, intimacy and family just comes to the fore at one point in time and we actually go and get married. So now you might be in, in the ages of 18 to 24, which I think is the most popular uh, crowd that Lighthouse attracts. And I saw a lot of quite a, quite a few of you who had given your surveys, uh, which, which was sent out before the marriage. Uh, will you get married? Quite a lot of maybe or no, right? And now it can seem like I have the best time of my life. You know, I got friends around and we can, we can hang around and we can talk to each other. But you will find that slowly your friends start to get married in, in, in the next few years, in, the, in a matter of the next five years. And suddenly you will find that the kind of social circle and the, and the connection and the, and, the, and the intimacy that you shared is slowly drifting away. And they're all having their own families and they're all getting around. And then you start finding uh, sooner or later that there is a need for you also to get married. So in the 1960s, an average, uh, even the men were getting married at about 24 years of age. And here we are in 2020, that, that average age is moved to about 29 to 30, but still marriage is happening. So marriage gives that, uh, you know, fulfills that need for that love and belonging. Uh, and we do go and get married. So the institution of marriage is no, going away nowhere. But what's happened? Now, this is what I call as the Generation AUI, right? Generation AUI. We are all products of the, we are all influenced by Generation AUI. So what is Generation AUI? The Amazon, Uber, Instagram, right? What is, what is, how are these, um, you know, these, um, you know, global phenomenons influencing us? Now, these are not just some company which is in the, in Seattle, in US. These are organizations and they have, um, uh, influence, which has actually become a global phenomenon, and they're influencing the whole world, regardless of which part of the world you go to, the influences of organizations like this can be seen. And I'm not specifically saying it's only Amazon or Uber or Instagram. I'm talking about a phenomenon that is caused by uh, organizations like this. And what is that phenomenon? One, number one, Amazon kind of tells us that don't be contented with what you have, but keep looking for more. 
Anyone who's been through Amazon's website will know that, right? It never allows you to make, go and make that easy choice unless and until you're so specific about what you want. It always, you, you, you want to go and buy something and then it gives you a, a, a plethora of options. And then you click on one thing and it tells you products similar to this. And then it gives you reviews and it gives you options over options. And you go and actually buy one thing and it is not like there you are, you're very content and you're contented and you're happy. No, it always tells you and it, it, it is set in such a way that you would come back to Amazon and desire for more. Amazon basically tells you, keep your options open, more options. Uber basically says, why own a car when you can actually enjoy the benefits of a car? Don't get committed to a car because if you want to commit to a car, you'll have to pay EMIs, you'll have to fuel your car, you'll have to pay for the insurance. Why get into all of that commitment when you can enjoy the benefits of a car without actually getting into the commitment of a car? And lastly, Instagram teaches us that don't reveal your non-makeup face, mask up and show a face which can generate more likes. Are you with me? Don't show a face without your makeup mask up and show yourself and put pictures which will generate the maximum number of likes. It actually tells you that, right, look, you can actually increase your connection without actually being truly authentic. You can hide your hurts, you can hide your pains to yourself, but put up a face which can generate more likes and generate more connections for you. More options, no commitment in authenticity. Now, as I said, this is not just particularly these companies. Think about flip cards or just about any of these. Now, people like us who use these services generally find these to be very, very useful in that materialistic world of being able to get what I want and being able to go and, you know, get, uh, you know, uh, go for, a, you know, uh, asking for what I want without having commitment and within authenticity. It works very well there, um, right? So... Uh, here we are, we have this as Gen AUI, we have this influence of more options, no commitment in authenticity. It works well in buying and moving from one place to another and for social connections, probably at a superfluous level. But what it does is we who have been trained by this as a generation, we've been so influenced by this more options, no commitment in authenticity. What it does is when we take these values and bring it into the other aspects and spheres of life, it has ramifications. And one of the prime examples is more options, no commitment in authenticity is revealing itself is in the form of live-in relationship, right? So in live-in relationships, more options are there, right? Why go and get committed to one person? And why show an authentic, no makeup face, you know, face of yourself, because it is still early days, you can actually show yourself as this nice, pretty, perfect person. And you don't have to become that with all your warts and all the flaws and all, you don't have to show it. There's still a, a lot of inauthenticity that's possible. So live in relationship actually is a, is a beautiful expression of all these coming together. Now, what is live in relationship at its core, right? Imagine two people decide to cohabitate, right? They decide that like, let's both come and live together. If they were to have a conversation, if they were to say a contract, like in a marriage, there is a vow, right? You say for better or poor, for health or sickness, I will be with you. If that kind of a commitment way to, or a contract way to be entered in a living relationship, it will sound like this. Nobody says that, but at the core, stripped of all, all its, you know, uh, peripherals, this is the core reality of living relationship. Living relationship contract will read something like this. For now, you're the best thing that has happened to me. And I want to try out with you. But who knows? I might actually find someone better. And I don't want to foolishly come and close myself of that option. So I want to keep that option also open. But for now, I also have companionship need. You also have companionship need. So let's just try it out. If they were to make a contract, that is the core of the contract through which they're going to be entering into a living relationship. Nobody says that. It sounds like progressive. You know, we are thinking differently. We're going to test it out. We're going to see if we will work for each other. But at the core, it is about for now, you're the best option. But who knows? Someone better than you might come out. 
I don't want to stupidly close my door for that. So I will get into this relationship with keeping one door at the entrance of, you know, keeping my leg one uh, at the entrance of the door. So if I need to walk out and get into another better relationship, I don't want to have locked it. Truly speaking, this kind of a proposal should actually absolutely frustrate and irritate a person who has heard it. It is, it is, it is disrespectful to the person who hears something like this. Uh, it should be it should be disrespecting the person at the core of who they are, but they don't get disrespect. They don't get disrespected, and they actually go along and get into this cohabitation because the partner also wants the same. Look, for now you seem to be the best person, but who knows someone better can come out. So if that happens, I want to keep my options open. More options, no commitment. Let's try it out. And that at the core is what live-in um, relationship is, okay? What else is the reality of a live-in relationship? When we talk about live-in relationship, there is also this societal stigma, the kind of social status, regardless of which progressive society in the world you go to, right? The, 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 society, the societal status that a marriage enjoys with, with friends and well-wishers coming and wishing and getting you off into your relationship is still missing in, in the live-in relationship, more so in an Indian context. Even in the, in the most urban cities, it is still a stigmatized one, reality of the live-in relationship. It is an easy way out because in marriage, you are committed to a person. You've got people to come and witness you and you got into that relationship. Know that there's, there's not, none of those over here. You can have a fight in the morning and you can decide to go and instead of cohabitating, you can individually go and have it in different places in the afternoon. Easy way out. Women suffer more biologically, uh, emotionally, and even societally. Women tend to suffer more. Of course, I mean, I'm not saying men don't suffer at all. Men do suffer in each of these aspects as well. But, you know, women suffer more biologically, right? Uh, and uh, you know, emotionally and societally. The stigma for women is a lot higher uh, when they've been into a live-in relationship and then they step out. So watch out, women suffer most. Men also do. It has adverse impact on children. Even if that live-in relationship progresses into marriage and out of the marriage you have children, it is still having an adverse impact on children simply because social scientists have found out that children who are born out of a live-in relationship tend to not respect the, you know, the, the rules and regulations of any uh, authority because their parents have defied some of these authorities and got together. The children don't get that sense of authority and the respect for authority because after all, they, their parents were an exception to it. So uh, you know, children have an adverse impact. Worst case, in a re living relationship, they have children and the parents separate the children go through enormous emotional trauma. Even in a marriage, if they go through, they go through a lot of stress and strain. But there is this judiciary, the, the, the judiciary framework comes in support of the vulnerable, which is the children. The family comes around, but in a living relationship, they're devoid of all of that. And the, and the exposure that the children get is just so painful, right? And the respect, which is typically there in a married relationship is missing in a living relationship, simply because in a marriage, me and my wife, we got into a commitment, right? It was not like for now, let's try it out. But, it's, but it is about, I'm going to live with you, come what me. That's what my wife promised me and I promised her. And when we got into a marriage, that is a lot of mutual respect for each other, saying just at my word, because I promise she has just left her family and come to me. And I have left my family and everything and I've come to her. That kind of a commitment and that kind of a, uh, uh, you know, the, that respect that I have for my wife is still missing in the living relationship. All right. All said and done. After the living relationship, if the couple decide to marry, the reality is it's about twice the higher amount of divorce rate than people who haven't cohabitated. Global average. In some countries, it's about 50% of the cohabitated people actually end up with divorce, right? So very high divorce rate um, in a living relationship. So about 10% global average of divorce happens. This is about 18.7%. People who had a living relationship, then got into a married, marriage, their divorce rate is about, is about you know, twice of people who did not get into a living relationship. So uh, if you look at what are some of the advantages, it'll actually talk about financial freedom. You have more responsibility. Your individualism is retained. 
it really is about a perspective whether you see them as advantages or if it is really about those are really the inhabitants which helps us to achieve what we want to remember the whole purpose of what we're talking about is uh because marriage or that relationship to fill, fill in that need for love and longing and belonging now does that financial independence and me retaining my individualism and me having better control there is no legal entanglements those advantages do they ultimately give me that feeling of longing uh, uh, you know the feeling for love and companionship does it fill that the question is the answer probably is no okay so when we talk about some of the advantages it looks like carefree you get to be yourself but then do you ultimately achieve what you set out to achieve probably the answer is no so that is what we look at in love and relationships so is marriage a certified love and so what is really marriage so i'm going to not take a uh, you know the holy books say so or you know tradition say so leaving all of that mumbo jumbo if you were to just look at it as pragmatically as we looked at love and relationship you know very very practically so what is marriage if you were to look at it i just want you to weigh these options what is marriage in reality pragmatically marriage is a voluntary surrender of my individualism right of my individual freedom and all of it i surrender it and then i get to trade that for a permanent companionship at the at the foundation level very practically right it's not me it's not my money it is not my time it is not my desire it is i buy what i want to buy i trade all of that and then say for this i want a permanent companion not for the next few weeks not for a few months till i feel like no it is for life for the next four to five decades i want to live with you for that i'm going to surrender it sounds hideous see let's see it is about adoption of responsibility typically married people yes there are exceptions you might have seen exceptions but typically average the norm is when people get married both the man and the woman step up to the responsibility they become a lot more socially responsible familially responsible or uh, in work responsible responsibility just, they just they just step up it is a commitment to love it is not the feeling of love i think if you have attended the earlier session you will realize that love is the will to do good it is not because i feel good so i do good no it is even when i don't feel good i have committed to do good to the other person and that commitment then in the you know engenders the the feeling so it is a commitment to love the person in spite of their imperfection in spite of their flaws and all because i am also an imperfect individual i have my flaws and all so there is two imperfect people just committing to love and be with each other right it's a commitment to love it is to learn to solve problems and in the process grow this is the this is the you know this is how the conversation really in the beginning of the marriage typically happens look i am imperfect you are imperfect you don't like a lot of my behaviors i don't like a lot of your behaviors we've had a huge argument just, just this night just i just can't believe that i actually kept my eyes open and walked into this marriage with you but we can either keep fighting like this for the next four or five decades or let's try to figure out a way to solve the problem so that the next four to five decades that we spend with each other we start to cherish and love and appreciate each other those who have had the maturity have figured out and with some help they will able to get their marriage right and then they are able to find out that they haven't lost themselves they've actually found themselves and they found themselves to be a whole people a lot more whole than just with all my imperfection and their imperfection that's what marriage does it is an institution which helps you to understand your imperfection before marriage you know if you ask me who is the most perfect individual that you can think of i would have without batting my eyelid i would have said well it's me and everybody feels that way before marriage that they are perfect they are responsible in every way come and you get married and you live with a spouse 24 by 7 and that person is able to reveal all your all your um, you know imperfection and the reality is what they're saying is right and then you find out as to how do we get to live with this person and spend our life together and we can either keep fighting our way throughout and kind of sleeping with a grudge in our head and a heavy heart or we can actually sort out and find out as to how to solve this problem and in the process grow with each other and grow as an individual and lastly kids who are born in a healthy marriage uh, relationship they seem to be head and shoulder above than their counterparts emotionally even academically kids who come from a healthy marriage relationship 
they just stand head and shoulder above. So which means we just kind of progenerate the next generation to be healthy, uh, you know, secure, you know, good whole individuals than individuals who are broken and who have a lot of, um, you know, issues. So that's what marriage does. So really the purpose of marriage is not just to be happy. And many of us think like that and Bollywood and Hollywood tells that. And right from our childhood in fairy tales, we read this and they lived happily ever after. Really the purpose of marriage is not just to be happy. It is really to be whole and holy. What I mean by holy, holy simply means to be set apart, which means it's not like live-in relationship. In the live-in relationship, you are not set apart. You, you, you live a part of your life with the other person with the door, with your leg at the, at the doorstep. But here in marriage, you're saying you and me are going to be one. And in that, nobody else has an influence in our lives. It's going to be just you and me. We are set apart for each other and set apart for a greater purpose. So that is holy. And together we become whole where my imperfection could be your strength and your imperfection could be my strength and we kind of complement each other. So that is the alternative that you have for marriage. Few are the benefits of marriage. It provides a new identity and societal standing. In any culture, a married couple have a far better uh, societal standing than, you know, um, than people, you know, uh, either with multiple sex partners or in living relationship. Marital um, relationship has a far better standing legally in, in, in several sense. It has a transformative effect on the behavior of individuals. I just spoke about it. My imperfections is filled by the other person to become a lot fuller. It gives meanings and meaning and purpose for life. Uh, married people seem to be a lot more responsible. They get up, wake up, and they pursue dreams. They pursue aspirations because they have a family to take care of both men and women. Married people are emotionally more healthy. They live longer. Uh, all these are statistics. Financial well-being. You might think financially, I'm independent. I'm my money. I can use it. I can save it. You think you are actually better off? Statistics say married men. I've just, I've just was able to find a you know statistic for men. Should be, should be approximately the same for women as well. Married men earn at least twenty percent higher than individual men simply because they know they have a family to take care. Even if I feel like sleeping a morning, I wake myself and push myself and get to work because if I'm being sloppy at work, I could be fired. And when I'm fired, it's not just me; it's my kids and my family who's going to struggle. They go for higher, you know, higher paying jobs. They pursue dreams and they simply earn and they are financially better off. It transforms the so social circle for the better, right? An unmarried guy could be hanging around with the hooligans and the lost before marriage, but after marriage, they actually average. There are exceptions, but most of them, their societal and the, the social circle changes. It, it, it becomes family friends. It probably becomes community friends. It becomes religious friends. And they're all people who probably have higher aspirations uh, than the ones they were, they were hanging around with before marriage, right? So the societal circles are uh, circle changes. So the, um, you know, uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, George Ekeloff says this, particularly talking about men, he says, men settle down when they get married. And if they fail to get married, they fail to settle down, right? So that is what he says. So in essence, if you think, let me just say this before I come to the slide. If you think live-in relationship is great because it gives you everything that a marriage gives, except that there is no certificate. In reality, it's about for now, I want to try it out with you. You think if that is a great meaningful relationship or the options and the benefits that I've shared with you, there is a voluntary surrender of your individualism in pursuit of being able to step up with all the benefits that I've shared. It's about total commitment. I do not know more about you. I know you are imperfect. I know I am also imperfect. But at your word, I'm ready to surrender myself and come, let's both figure out how to live out. It is not about I got my you know, options open, no commitment. I can't live in authentically with you. I've got to commit. I've got to close out all the options and it is going to be total authenticity. But in the process, what I do is this, that I do not lose myself just for the sake of losing myself, but you lose yourself to find yourself. All of us want to retain ourselves, but the truth is in the process of trying to retain ourselves, we become a nobody. But when we lose ourselves, it really we find ourselves. I would say that I've lost a lot of what I was before marriage, but in the process, between me and my wife, we found out together who we are which I don't think would have ever happened without me having you know, gone through this marriage of sorting out this enormous differences that do keep coming up and finding out that we got to sort it out. 
And then we find out when you do that, you lose yourself in the process, but in the process, you actually find yourself, right? And that is actually worth it. But more importantly, in reality, there is no other option. In a living relationship or a you know, multiple sex partner relationship or any of those, you still lose yourself and you don't find yourself. You just keep thinking that you've retained your individuality, but every day probably as you grow older, you find out that you suddenly wake up and you find what is the purpose of all of this? Who do I have for my longing and companion relationship? And you actually find nobody there. But in the process of total surrender, total commitment, closing out all other options and living an authentic relationship, sorting the differences, growing and becoming whole seems to be a shackling, uh, totally you know, committed process. But in the process, uh, you actually grow and you actually find yourself. So that's my alternative that I went to you with what living can do and what marriage can do. Is marriage a certified living? No, no. They are very, very different. Marriage is about total surrender and living is about more options, no commitment in authenticity. Mm -hmm.